So part two, this was the integration and it gave you guys some trouble. So let me try and explain. There are at least two things in my mind or two reasons why um, that this integration and this particular result would give you some grief. So let me start off by uh, writing out the equation of motion because to review in part two, the question, they literally said, by integrating the equation of motion. This is this is, has to be our starting point, right? So I've got mg minus kv squared on the right hand side. Now at this point, um, we can begin, like the first step is a pretty autopilot sort of step, right? I wanna separate out my variables and prepare for the integration process. It's after that that the work and the thinking really begins. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to separate out my, my v's and my t's as best as I can. Um, I've got the dv on the left hand side there already and that's going to stay put but you can see my v terms are over here on the right hand side so I'm just going to divide through uh, by that mg uh, minus kv squared like so. And um, often we sort of pull this trick where we say, oh look, that constant, um, that constant coefficient out there, um, let's, let's take it over to the right hand side and integrate it with t because that's where that's going to end up, like so. However, in this case, the question gives me a clue that that's not really worthwhile, right? Because have a look, when you can see up here, on the left hand side, I'm just gonna land on a t equals whatever uh, equation, right? So therefore, um, getting that dt isolated completely on um, that right hand side to, in sort of, as I head towards integration uh, makes sense because I don't, I'm not going to want anything with that t uh, in the end so I might as well not put anything there um, on the way. So therefore that m which is here on the left hand side to begin with I'm just going to leave it there on the left hand side and it stays put. Okay now at this point like I said we're now preparing for integration and there's a couple of things you want to keep in mind okay. The first one is uh, at this point it's a fairly normal instinctive thing to just do the integration and just say, yeah, I'm just gonna whack on, I'll use this color here, I'm just gonna whack on these integral signs and then off I go and eventually I'm, go I'm gonna have a constant of integration to have to deal with and I'll use initial conditions in some way to, um, to evaluate that, right? And that's fine. In theory, there's no problem with that approach. However, I'm gonna make a case for why it actually might be useful for us to actually um, treat this as a definite integral. We've seen this a little bit in the past, um, but it's kind of a technique we often don't go to. We tend to use this as an indefinite integral and then deal with the constant later. My suggestion for why this is useful is when you have a look at the result that's been required to prove, there's this amazing symmetry there, right? And you can see how often VT, the terminal velocity, appears in here. So I'm gonna have to do a substitution for that, but you've also got this V naught that appears in here, and it's just such a symmetrical result. I kind of wanna take advantage of that symmetry in my integration process and do that sooner rather than later. The sooner you can make things symmetrical, the easier they are to deal with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna integrate, as you maybe remember from before, but it's been a while since I've been in mechanics land, I'm in gonna integrate from an initial condition up to some arbitrary time, right? So an arbitrary time is literally just, you know, t, whatever time you like. When you have some arbitrary time, um, you will have some arbitrary velocity, right? So this t and this v are going to be variables. But then when you think about the initial condition, this is when um, Jack and Jill, they first pull their parachute. So that's defined, if you go back to the question's initial paragraph, as time zero, and their initial velocity, um, it's not the initial one as they jump out of the plane, that's just zero, right? They're vertically stationary, because they're still on the plane. But once they hit their chute, that's defined as V zero, right? So you can see I've kind of placed all of these um, all of these upper and lower bounds quite thoughtfully based on where I'm going to be headed, okay? Now, I said um, that I need to think carefully about this result I'm required to prove, and this is probably where the obstacles were for some of you. I've dealt with the fact that these V0s appear, they're going to come into my definite integral once I evaluate the upper and lower bounds, but there's no VTs, right? Um, I don't have, I haven't written anything here about VT because I don't really want to put like infinity and then a VT here because um, infinity is not actually a number that I can just substitute in, right? It's a limiting process. Um, so where are these VTs going to appear? And I think the clue for you is by noticing what's here on the left-hand side and what isn't in the result that's required to prove. Did you notice it? Do you realize there's no reference to the mass of Jack or Jill, um, nor is there a reference to K, this constant of proportionality, which sometimes we call the drag coefficient, right? No M's, no K's, suddenly it's all just, oopsie daisy, it's all just VT's, right? See these guys? So this is your clue for how we're gonna have to use part one. Um, part one tells us VT in terms of M's and G's and K's. The G is gonna stay put, you can see one right there, but the M's and K's we are gonna need 
to get rid of and we're gonna do substitution um, in terms of VT, okay? So, um, that was a lot of thinking before we did any writing um, when we did put these integral signs on, but we're now ready to go, okay? Um, I'm gonna pull just a little quick move here, which is to pop my, my T terms on the left-hand side because that's where they're gonna end up. My result that I'm required to prove is a T equals etc. So, I'm gonna go, here's the uh, uh, upper bound and here's the lower bound. So, there's the whole original right-hand side completely integrated. What do I get on the other side with all my, my M's and V's and that kind of thing, okay? Uh, what I'm gonna do is uh, a couple of steps before I actually perform the integration here, right? Uh, I'm gonna have this M, which is a constant coefficient out the front, and then I've got my integral from V naught to V of one over MG minus KV squared. Okay, now just pause on this for a moment and think about how, how can you deal with this, right? What is going to be a tool that you can use? We've dealt with quadratic denominators before. Um, what is gonna be the most helpful um, way to get out of this? And again, if, if it's not immediately apparent to you, the question gives you some clues, right? That result that's required to prove, it's a log, right? I mean, you have to see through all this other pronumeral stuff in there, but it's log of some stuff. And then when you notice in here, you've got this product and this um, denominator here, uh, product in the numerator and a product in the denominator, I should say. If you know your log laws well, one of the things you can see is what this will come from is um, a series of log terms, some of which are added and some of which are subtracted, right? Because when you add and subtract log terms, that becomes multiplication and division inside of the log, right? So that should be the clue to you that well, how, what, what's gonna give you a bunch of different log terms that you can separately, um, will come out of the integration and you can separately put together? And the answer is, this is gonna be a bunch of partial fractions. Do you see that? Um, you're not, I mean, you could try and complete the square down here. Um, you could try and treat this as like, ooh, is this one of these like inverse trig um, integrals because I've got a quadratic in the denominator? And the answer is that log term in the result you're required to prove should signal to you that I'm gonna to need to separate this out into a pair of different fractions that will then become logs, excuse me, after I integrate, okay? So, like I said, there's a fair bit of questioning here and I think this is probably why some of you had trouble with this integral. Just before I get there, to make this even clearer, right? You can see I've got these M's and G's flying around, which I still haven't, um, sorry, M's and K's flying around that I haven't gotten rid of, right? So how do I deal with this? Well, what I'm gonna do, is um, noticing if I go back up here, right? Can you see this line? Um, I'm gonna highlight it like so. This line right here. Um, I can use this anytime I can see M's and K's. I can use that to get rid of um, VT squared, right? Or I use that to put in VT squared, I should say. So um, a couple of ways I can say that is, well, let's first call this equation one. Um, you can see if I just have an M and a K by itself, what that tells me is that M over K is going to be VT squared all divided by G. Can you see I just divided both sides by G on that, um, on that equation. So therefore I'm going to call this equation here 1A. And you can use both 1 and 1A to do a substitution on this integral um, so that you get the VTs appearing that you're supposed to get in your requ result that you're required to prove. Okay. Uh, let's divide through by K, for example, because you can see I've got this M on K hanging out the front, which I can do a substitution of. But if I put that M on K out the front, what's that gonna leave me with on the inside? Well, I'll just leave that numerator alone. Um, you can see the K is gonna come out of here just fine, so that will leave me with a minus V squared. But then here, it's gonna become mg on k. Usually we try and avoid fractions inside fractions, but this one's gonna work for us because I know what mg on k is equal to from equation one, right? So this one here is gonna be, I'll highlight that, that's gonna be equation one that I'll use to substitute, and this one will be equation one a, if I just sort of scroll up, hopefully you can see them both there, right? So there's the m on k, there's the mg on k, which I can, which I can do here. So, uh, let's do the substitution and there will be no more M's and K's to worry about, right? What do I get out the front? This is the VT squared on G that I was mentioning. And then inside, I'm gonna have, I've still got these um, boundaries here which I haven't dealt with yet. I've got one on, uh, that's VT squared, and then I've got a minus V squared, 
over there, okay? Now maybe this is starting to shape up for you because when you said, well, when I said uh, partial fractions, you might have said partial fractions of what? Um, and now you can see this difference of squares appearing on the denominator, so you can actually deal with that as well, you, each of your factors will become a separate denominator, right? So just to make that um, a bit clearer, you can see um, I'm going to write the same constant coefficient out the front, but I'll write that factorization just to make it a little clearer what I'm doing. So here come the difference of squares, um, vt minus v and vt plus v.